So it's my pleasure. I've been looking forward to uh, the reading tonight. We know uh, our poet tonight, Carlos Riez, is a poet, a translator, a traveler. Uh, he's traveled uh, widely. One of the things that is uh, incorporated in his work is his observations uh, from his travels. He lives in Oregon. Uh, he's journeyed to Alaska, Ecuador, France, India, Ireland, Panama, or Spain. And his awards and honors include the Oregon Arts Commission Fellowship for Poetry, a fellow at the Island Institute, which is in Sitka, Alaska, the Heinrich Boll Fellowship in Ireland, and a fellow at Yaddo. Pardon me? I can stop now. Well, there is just so much to say. <laughs> I think the one thing I do want to say is, one of the things we're going to hear from is his new book. He does have a long list of awards. He does have a long list of books. He's been extensively published. His latest book is Guilt in Our Pockets, Poems from South India. Would you join me in welcoming our poet for tonight, Carlos Riez. I didn't mean to cut you off, Tom, but I, I sat there listening, nodding my head, and I began to wonder if I know who that person is you're talking about. <laughs> but you can, you know. Uh, it always reminds me I was down at, uh, actually, I was down at uh, Medford, uh, not Ashland, but somewhere down there in the south, and I was, I was going to give a reading at, at the college, and somebody got up to, to read my uh, bio, and it was two pages long, single-spaced. <laughs> but so, but you didn't do that bad. So, I'm very happy to be here uh, tonight, and uh, thanks a lot to the uh, to the Milwaukee Poetry Series, to the library, to Tom, to the committee, all those folks that make this possible. And I would also like to rec. Uh, when I learn to talk, I'll talk. I'd like to also. Uh, uh, recognize a couple of three people in the audience. The people came up for miles and miles to hear me read tonight. Uh, two people I know of came from Nebraska. My, my, my niece, Linda, and her husband, Tom. And of course, my old friend, uh, Chip Phillips, came all the way from Jacksonville, Florida. I mean, Jacksonville, Oregon. So, uh, and a lot of friendly faces, and I see some people who can't get enough of my poetry. I've seen them at least one reading uh, since last week. So I'm happy to be here and happy to, to uh, share with you these poems that I wrote while I was in India uh, about six years ago. And uh, my sort of plan is to read first from this, this book, Guilt in Our Pockets, uh, Poems from South India, and then read a few poems after that from uh, Arm Wrestling with the Mistral, poems from the south of France. So I'll give you a bit of a, a heads up on a, on a new collection. And I'll begin by just reading, there's a little epigraph at the beginning uh, that's from a book called The 19th Century Traveler. And this person said, when we travel to the Eastern world, whether it be pounds or rupees, we carry guilt in our pockets. That's kind of the uh, tone of the book. And the first poem is, is Namaste. And uh, regrettably, perhaps, Namaste, which means at least hello, and maybe as deep as I recognize your spirituality, well, this lovely expression has become bumper stickers and buzzwords in this country. I bet you've seen a bumper sticker that says namaste. But I like it, and, and I also like it because I think it's the first Hindi word I ever learned back in 1959 in Tucson, Arizona. I met an Indian senator, and before I met him, I made sure to know how to say hello to him. A lot of stuff ahead of this poem, uh, and it's it's dedicated to Asha, who suggested this that maybe uh, 
as we were about to leave, we were showered with gifts. As a matter of fact, so many gifts we couldn't bring them back. Uh, and so we wondered, what do we give them? And Asha said, why don't you write us a poem? <laughs> Nothing easier, right? <laughs> Namaste. These few short weeks, we braid our lives together as we commune with poetry, music, chapati, dal, chai. As we travel to the jungle lodge at the Kabini River, joyous music pulls us from our seats, puts us to dancing in the aisles of the bus, to raucous singing, clapping as we bounce along over speed bumps through Mysore, Chana Pan, Pat, Patna, and Madur. On the journey to Goa and back, we share the haunting melancholy and at times joyous songs and take strains of India. Music will keep with us always. We have a language in common, though our English must seem flavorless compared to theirs, sp spiced with Hindi, Kannada, Tamil. We wonder how the friendship we leave you can ever equal what we take away. The flavor of South India, the curry, the cardamom, tamarind, yet on our tongues. I could say too, uh, tamarind and still on our lips, <laughs> you know. Um, one of the things, I have a long experience, and some of you who know me know this, with, with doing physical labor, working in construction and so forth. Whatever you think about being a poet, there's, there's always room for some way or other to earn bread to put on the table. And in my case, uh, construction was one of them and, and physical labor. And what it did to me was it made me, I guess it kind of made me aware of what a construction laborer looks like in India. And it's like nothing you could believe. Where a ditch has been opened in the earth. A standing black plastic bag, small feet beneath it, then movement, a child at play. Blind inside her plastic garb, she drifts to within inches of the precipice. Her sorry clad mother in the ditch itself scrapes red dirt into a shallow copper bowl, offers it up, a sacrifice to the sun. They have a wonderful custom in India, at least in South India, that's the only India I know, of honoring the whatever it is that brings them their livelihood. And I love it uh, uh, during uh, that season when the big Tata trucks are so decorated with garlands of flowers that you wonder how the driver can see through the windshield. Or if it happens to be an elephant, they paint them with chalk and so on and so forth. Well, this is about a different uh, animal that gives someone their livelihood. Man walking cow. He has saved her from four lanes of traffic on the inner ring road of Domludu, brushed her black coat to a sheen, and dressed her up from the tip of curved ho upward horns that she could hook the yellow moon with to her well-trimmed hooves that are the nails of a princess, wrapped her in blood red and green yarns, elegant silk saris, and bleeding madras. He leads her like a drunken bride through the posher neighborhoods, showing her the quieter worlds to humbly honor her, his means of livelihood, or simply to shame those who look down on him and her I'm sorry, those who look down on him and his cow from higher windows. Mm. 
Oh, yes. Dom Ludu hod carrier. Now, I don't even know if they still exist, but a, a hod is usually a, a, a kind of a, a wooden scoop that's attached to a, a handle uh, so that you can carry bricks or mortar uh, on your shoulder. And uh, I found a different hod carrier in a bright red sari. She walks to the sand pile, fills her hod, the ubiquitous, shallow, dome-shaped bowl, balances it perfectly on her head, walks poised as though a model to an, in, to an angled wire screen, though, though she threw... I can't see, I guess. Excuse me. <laughs> Is there a light? I guess not. Uh, okay. <laughs> I could do this. No, that's okay. Don't 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 upturn the world just to, so I can see. I'll just make it up if I can't get it right. But it, it causes me to stumble from time to time. And I looked back and I said, "That's not what I said." Let's rewind it here and uh, and go back to this Don Bluetu hot carrier. In a bright red sari, she walks to the sand pile, fills her hod, the ubiquitous, shallow, dome-shaped bowl, balances it perfectly on her head, walks poised like a model to an angled wire screen through which she sifts, she tosses sand, sifting it clean the way at home she sifts wheat flour for lumps or weevils. She glances at the screen. Nothing is caught on the wire. The screen, this clean sand, is a growing pile. She mixes into mortar on the sidewalk. She works cement into the sand with the short hoe with the same diligence and grace she uses when she makes dough for chupati in her kitchen. Uh, I said it. I said uh, at one point to someone that every day I was in India, I saw something marvelous. That line appears in his poem is the only reason I mentioned it. But I did. Uh, India is a kind of place I never thought I would ever go to. But being the person I am, I had the opportunity, and I went, and I, and I loved it. I never thought I would. I loved the people. I loved the food. I did not love the poverty. Kite flyers along the inner ring road. Every morning I walk this way, on the way to get a cup of chai. The vacant lot on my left is empty except for the pile of construction debris or sometimes a cow or two grazing. But this morning, as if by magic, there is something new and marvelous here. Two boys behind a concrete block wall are trying to launch a homemade kite. One stands on a pile of broken blocks holding the ball of twine, the other 40 feet away holds a diamond, an old, an old newspaper stretched on the silhouette of a cross. I watch them hoping, I watch them hoping, though their efforts seem futile, the wind is light, their knowledge of aeronautics slight. <laughs> Behind me, a cop on the beat in his brown uniform and beret who lives nearby, stops, observes me, vaguely interested for a minute, then continues on. He's going through his pockets as though searching a suspect, still trying to scrape up the seven rupees for a small plastic cup of sweet chai as he walks toward a group of men gathered beneath the blue tarp. He's not having any luck nor are the boys. I want to go through the gate into the lot, offer my technical advice, 
Tell them that their kite needs a tail to st stabilize it before it can fly. I'd offer to help the cop find a few coins for his chai, but though he lives in a hovel, he wears a uniform, has his pride, and is not about to be caught taking a handout that looks like a bribe. From the corner, I can't resist. I look back. The kite rides the breeze above the wall. The cop stands. Steam rises from his milky sweet chai under the blue tarp of morning. Uh, in India, they still pick cotton by hand. And if you have even the slightest knowledge of cotton picking, it's murder on your fingers, on your cuticles. It kills you. Mm, terrible. Before Chetra Durga, NH4, sundown, people still picking cotton, though the crescent moon was starting to rise. Some walking away from the fields, cotton bag balanced on their heads, men and their bullock carts fighting the current of the traffic river. On, each, on one such cart, a man and his family pile atop sacks of cotton, leave the fields to darkness. As it begins to rain, I hope for three things that these families returning in the fields can abandon their labor, that rain will make their cotton way more, that before night catches them out, they will arrive safely home. I say this because of what I know. Cotton weighs nothing, gains the picker only bleeding cuticles. Cotton balls did not tear my fingers in India, but whatever and wherever I picked in childhood, blistered and stained them, is stinging abetted by a taskmaster who never let us quit until the last dog died, or until the sun was dead and gone, and the moon's sick light could not distinguish green from ripe. If cotton picking is probably the only thing I ever picked in my life. <laughs> Never picked in my life. <clears throat> Thread count. How many threads per square inch in the white sheets she's going to sleep on? The woman ahead of me at the, at the bedding shop wants to know. The clerk won't be able to answer when I ask him how many brown fingers have those white threads gone through before arriving here? How many lives do these threads reach back to? What happened to the drops of blood from the cuticles torn by cotton balls in the fields of India, Egypt, Well, some of you will know that the, the Prince Henry, the navigators, uh, sailors, uh, I think were the first to discover the coast of India on the way to, to China. And Bosco da Gama is the person I'm thinking of as one of those sailors. Uh, the poem about that sort of thing. A long involved title with a lot of history in it. As I wade the waters of the Arabian Sea, I want a sailing ship, the Vasco da Gama, to cross between me and the setting sun. Instead, cargo ships. Somehow this is Goa, stunning, th somehow this is Goa, stunning sunset on the Arabian Sea, but running lights of ships Rising planets with stars all compete with 4th of July sparklers, though it is November, cutting torches, turning a ship 
aground on the pristine beach into scrap. A string of white anchor lights, the long parade of freighters, side lights burning, ready to move into the Mondavi River to take on red ore, basmati, rice, silk, cast iron, sewer manhole lids. Never did I imagine in my days of civil engineering that the India on the tops of those iron covers meant that someone in a foundry barefoot in India cast them. I had someone in, my, in the audience the other night challenge me, the men really work in foundries barefooted? They do in India. <laughs> she didn't believe me, even though I told her I once worked in a foundry, not barefooted, but lots of protection. Shoes about this thick. <laughs> Goa street scene. Oh, I should say that there's a, well, it doesn't really mention it, but uh, while we were in India, we went to a jungle safari uh, lodge and saw wild elephants. And there's nothing like seeing an elephant tear the top out of a tree and eat it while you're watching. <laughs> But uh, they're pretty docile, you know, they, they go along and, but every once in a while, they just can't take it anymore. And a, and a few months before we were in India, a group of them left the jungle refuge and went into Mysore and just tore the town up, tearing up shops and houses and until they got tired and they went back home. But so this this, in, this Indian ele uh, I'm sorry, Asian elephant uh, looks very docile, but maybe not. <laughs> Goa street scene. You look for sandals in a shop along 18th of June Road in Panjum. I watch the street. A bull elephant saddled with two teak logs holds almost as much sway as sacred cows as he plows through afternoon traffic. Leg irons clanking. I imagine the rainbow chalk dust from last week's Ayudhya Puja festival. Trappings from times when he transported rajas to the palace, but in his baleful eye, in his thundering drumbeat heart, he runs amok with wild elephants, rampages through shops like these. <laughs> I've never read this poem before, and uh, I couldn't resist. I have to tell you that I am the, I, I eat anything that crawls on the land, flies in the air, or swims in the sea. <laughs> eat. Little note from, a, from the uh, India Times of November 4th, 2011. Quote, the driver of a meat truck was found dead this morning. Animal rights people are suspected. <laughs> <laughs> Two dusty wool laden sheep kneel tethered to a light pole on a busy street a discreet distance from the small butcher shop a few doors down. There's no grass for the sheep to graze. They are lackluster, ignore the food put before them. No amount of bleating will attract a petting child or, their, or elicit sympathy for these storybook animals. The way passerby shun beggars we shun the sheep. In their dull eyes, we see nothing, but they feel the knife, they're resigned. We know their fate, choose to ignore it, though we can smell the gore, the blood dripping from their hanging carcasses, the swarm of flies, while pepper-fried mutton on our place is delectable. 
flavorful aroma assails our senses. A picture of butchering we put safely away in the back rooms. Hunger is not the reflection of the big gilt-edged mirror in the meat, in the big, big gilt-edged mirror, but the meat we crave, eat. Okay, I tried it, couldn't resist it. <laughs> and this is the poem that's on the broadside. It's called "Fennel Seeds" or "Fennel." as you will. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Fennel seeds. The waiter brings a slip of white paper on a small saucer. I put onto it money enough to pay for a cup of chai. He returns with my change on the small saucer. I pick through coins, leaves one or two rupees, he takes the plate, soon returns at this time with a small mound of fennel seeds. Walking away, I chew, reflecting on what just transpired, steaming wet, steaming sweet, milky chai wakes my senses. I hope the chewing brings an answer to why we have so much and they so little, or is it? the other way around. I'm sorry to be so slow here. You're all so attentive and it's so warm in here. <laughs> I'm reading, I think I'm reading my own poems here, but I'm having trouble, <laughs> having a little trouble seeing it. I'm not having a very good job, doing a very good job of faking, faking it either, I guess. Uh, this is called uh, uh, For Tagore, for India. And Tagore was a famous Bengali poet, famous enough to have gotten the Nobel Prize. He was also an acquaintance or friend of W.B. Yeats. I think, in fact, Yeats translated some of Tagore's poetry. And uh, the only other thing here is uh, an innocent abroad. When I went to India uh, six years ago, I thought that in 1948, with independence and all that, the caste system went by the way. It did not. It did not. There are still women in their elegant saris sweeping the street for maybe a couple of three or four rupees. You know. For Tagore, for India. Today, which untouchable bends from the waist holding her sari in one hand comes with her wisp to sweep out the dark corners of your great sleeping heart. Okay, that's India. And uh, I hope, I, I'm gonna go out and read some, some poems from the south of France. And uh, maybe I'm getting warmed up, maybe I can read without stumbling uh, and misreading and all that stuff. Somebody asked me tonight, are you nervous about this reading? And I said, it's only a poetry reading. What's to be nervous about? You must have been right. Uh, I've had, uh, tra speaking of traveling, a uh, distinct pleasure of spending two months in India, uh, in uh, France, where are we? Uh, France, at, at two different, in two different years, uh, Last year in August, uh, my wife and I traded houses with a French couple and uh, stayed in a farmhouse in, in Provence in Arles. Wow. Pretty nice. And the year before that, I had spent a month in a uh, kind of a monastery, a medieval place along the Seine River uh, south of Paris. So from these two uh, uh, residencies, I, I call our thing a residency, I have uh, this collection coming, I hope, it's called uh, Arm Wrestling with the Mistral, poem from the south of France. Now, if you don't know what the Mistral is, it's this wind. Uh, somehow, uh, some way, this incredible low-pressure system develops 
in the Gulf of Naples and sucks all the air down out of the Alps and creates these huge winds. You will see in the daytime about, about lunchtime, all the restaurants have the, the nice tablecloths and the china and the cutlery all laid out on tables. The straw comes along, <laughs> away it goes. It's a fierce wind. Its only real value is that it cools the temperature down about 20 degrees, which is, uh, while it happens to be very warm in, in the summer. Monday morning, Pont de Croix. Paris is far away. Peace here, living daily, commerce on the street, beneath arcades left by the Romans. People come and go from the boulangerie with their baguettes. Elsewhere, on crowded side, walks a squad of French soldiers, quiet, grim, bulletproof vests, automatic weapons. Not a smile cracks their armor, unwhispered the red word, so close to its twin, the word for earth and vineyards. The red word, if you know, terror, I don't know how to pronounce it, terror, T-E-R-O-I-R. -E One little syllable away from the, the red word. One of the marvels of, of Arles, there are many, is the uh, city of the dead. Um, Alicamp and uh, that's what this poem is about. Monsieur Gauguin in Alicamp. And there's a little epigraph that says, the bell tower of Saint Honorat serves as a lantern to the dead. He goes to the city of the dead with his buddy Vincent, sometimes to paint, at other times to display his canvases in their open air gallery. Strollers pay no attention. They gape at the water trough sarcophagi like park benches strung out along cathedral rows of sycamores, touch dusty surfaces for good luck, dare death. Vincent judges the debris, empty coffins, lids strewn about as sacrilegious. A usual day of few eyes traveling over paintings leaning against coffins. Gauguin paints the trees that want anxious faces peeking from behind them. The mistral comes turning, scattering canvases like leaves at the iron gates the artists bid adieu. Vincent returns to their rooms to a glass of green absinthe. Gauguin hangs back, weary of Vincent's preaching, sure if all that's left hovering above the trees and stone are the souls of the dead, then they are thin as canvas he paints. He does not believe they will return to claim their beds, but just in case hides in one of his, in his own sarcophagus, waiting not for the moon, but for the cupola of St. Honorat Church, the lantern light. Don't get restless. <laughs> Not over yet. No, kidding. Uh, it's easy for me to say because, you know, you're like, we used to call it in, in college a captive audience. I mean, I think one person left already, so maybe you're not a captive audience. I assumed you were. Uh, somebody didn't tell me? I don't know. Well, as much as there was a marvel a day to see in India, there was at least a marvel a day to see in, in La Belle France, in Provence especially, it's a wonderful place. And this poem is called Peche Merle. It's one of the caves that you'll find in France, in the countryside, and one of the caves that has paintings in it dating back 45,000 years. So this is the, the first uh, poem about the caves. Peshmerla. Under the blackbird's hill, in a cavern, the gallery ceiling hangs a thick wet rope, tempting me to touch it, 
to climb up to stalactites, count seconds into centuries. Up on the surface, droughts, lone survivor, an oak sends out one root breaking through limestone down to dripping moisture. That's us sooner or later, like the oak root drilling to survive with the same desperate search, fighting for the last few drops of water. And this is another, this is about cave paintings and it's called Six Hands and some of you might have seen these pictures of the horse with the hands around it. It's amazing. And uh, so of course, I suppose like everyone, I have to write my poem about the horse. Six Hands. She walks once more into the grotto, pine, pitch, torch, flickering, indistinguishable from the paintings of the other artists she passes. She's finished the outline of the horse in wavering shadows, but yesterday in the high meadow she saw the horse. It was spotted, something she hadn't noticed before. The spirits had marked it as theirs. She hurries back to the grotto to add her own touch of wizardry. She doesn't immediately see the horse, fears it has already escaped or been taken, thinking she only dreamed the painting of such a horse. A dream started it all, one of a horse of stone in a cave. She followed the dream, found only its head that drove her on. Her system of belief wouldn't allow a headless horse she returned, adding the finishing touch, the spots that connect her horse with the one she saw in the high meadow. Holding the torch in her right hand, putting her very breath in it, she blows paint through a bone, sprays a stencil of her left hand. The handprint says, this is mine. Whatever the gods say, this is my creation. She likes what she sees, but not satisfied that one hand has enough magic, she adds a second, her right hand, a third, and on until she has surrounded the horse with her magic hands, enough to keep the spirit rustlers from making off with it, putting it back in the high meadow to hoodwink foolish hunters. She knows she's corralled the animal with enough magic to keep him from escaping the dark cave and galloping away like Equios, uh, the bright foal, into the northern sky. I believe it's Aquilius, I don't know, Latin or Greek. Yeah. It's called Canal Bank Walk and it's dedicated to Patrick Kavanaugh. And uh, some of you will know that in Dublin, uh, the uh, Grand Canal, along the Grand Canal, there's a bench, the Patrick Kavanaugh bench, which has a, uh, the poem that he wrote about a canal bank walk on it. And I'm taking a canal bank walk, but this is not quite as elegant as, as the Grand uh, Canal. Canal bank walk for Patrick Kavanaugh. An electric blue dragonfly settles briefly on my shoulder as I cross the bridge, humped up over the Canal de Vigorat. As I walk the bank east, a little egret flies from me along a, wedding, a waterway that floats dead refrigerators, plastic bottles, water lilies that shine, fooling me into thinking they are birds as the wind lifts their weary leaves like saddened wings. I abandon the Canal Bank walk drawn through the eye of a railroad underpass to a ruin of remaining corners, two chimneys, crumbled walls, surrendering to brambles, Camargue canes. Then to the right, there are three pre-dismantled caravans. I think it's a salvage yard. Then see, people live there. I intrude no further on these traveling people denigrated by some as gypsies. Whoever they are, they have a place, 
across the tracks, hidden from the road. I turned back past a small park where earlier a kite soared overhead to land in the treetops where an old woman in charcoal guards the shadows. Okay, I'll try to read this. This is a, that's a bit longer. And I did some, some things with this. I don't know French well enough to be able to say the three Maries, blah, 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 blah. So I just changed it just kind of into Spanish, I made it easier. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I called it the uh, uh, Saint Sara and the Three Marias. In a night of whispered shadows, they push off from Palestine in a coracle without sail or rudder. They drift an unmoored moon Aboard three Marias and saved from the sea, Sara, winds, currents sweep their small boat toward a pencil line mirage. Now a model of their boat hangs over the altar of Our Lady of the Sea, standing in the boat, about to capsize two Marias, search the sea for Maria Magdalena. In a corner, her feet on solid ground, Sarah. Black saint of the gypsies, travelers, Romany, the Gasson. Labels we use to paint them as dangerous outsiders. Dark Sarah is one of them, mysterious, more impressive than her sisters. Her people come from around the world in May, take her to the sea to celebrate the voyage. It is August, the hordes, tourists, and pilgrims, not pilgrims, Remnants of Sarah's followers roam a small plaza marked out as the place of the gypsies, away from the big church, the wealthy travelers, beneath watchful windows of the Marie. Romany do what people at the edges do to survive. They sell religious medals, images of St. Sarah, it's made of silvery pot metal, Brass that shines like the sun of Provence. A few coins buys aroma, buys Roma luck, always with you, even as it turns green on your skin. Saint Sara is with you. When you polish brass, you witness another miracle as it turns back into Roma gold. Thank you for your patience. Now it's your turn. Are, are there some questions? I knew it. Tom, what is it? <laughs> he's, 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 the, he's the show. Well, someone has a question first, but it's a writing question, Carlos. Um, and it's, the first part is, what, what is your writing practice? And is it different when you're traveling? You travel a lot. Is it different when you're in India or when you're in Provence? Uh, no, it's better when I'm in India or Provence. In other words, I know I'm, in, I'm being privileged to be in a place where I can devote myself entirely to writing and pick up on everything that's going on around me. And that doesn't always happen in Portland, sitting at my computer, <laughs> seriously. Um, so it is different. And I have terrible practices, I'll confess to all of you here. I'm not, I'm not the William Stafford who who gets up at 4.30 every morning and writes for three hours. No. <laughs> uh, maybe I write and maybe I don't, but I like, someone said that, well, I don't write every day, but I'm always thinking about it. Well, that's kind of me, I guess. And I don't write every day, and I don't always write in my notebook, and I write silly stuff in my notebook, like it's 85 degrees, that sure is hot. You know, <laughs> where's the poem in that? Um, so uh, I, I have, bad writing habits, but I, I still seem to be able to write way more than probably is, is good for me. I mean, I'm a very prolific writer. 
as you will notice by a few of the books back there, uh, somebody pointed out to me that this is my 10th book, ninth book. I didn't know, I guess. I mean, I, you know, I write a lot of poems, but yeah. So that didn't answer your question, probably. What was the second part of the question? No, it does. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, what was your writing do as I do, don't do as I say. That's my writing practice, I guess. Anybody else have? Yes, thank you. Has anyone ever painted a picture of the vision you create with your words? Oh, please don't get me into this. <laughs> <laughs> I think of two things. One, I'm up this sort of retreat, and this woman we're sitting with, I don't know why I'm so dry tonight, sitting with our feet in this spa hot pool, and this woman says, you have an interesting face. Would you like me to paint you? That's not the same thing. Uh, but uh, <laughs> there was another, I hate to say this because the person involved, deeply involved in this is sitting in the audience. Uh, it was a great idea someone had of, of, of giving uh, poets and writers a, a painting or a photograph and have them write about it. And then, How'd that go? And then turn what they wrote over to a painter and have the painter paint it. Mm. And in many cases, I think it worked well. But in my case, I hated the painting. And I said, is that my poem? <laughs> you know? So <laughs> I, without being too silly, no, I, I think those are all good ideas if it works. If you can make it work, I think it's a great idea. And people all the time, uh, I see this all the time, people you know, they, they, they look at paintings, and they write poems, and they read the National Geographic, and the pictures in Geographic, they make poems. You know, whatever works for you. So I think that's not a very serious answer, but. I mean, it did feel like you were painting. I mean, I'm an artist, and have been all my life. And you were painting words. OK. I well, I can accept that. And there are <coughs> several people, I won't mention any names, who say that Painters and poets get along really well. They really understand each other. Do you have a question? <laughs> uh, Carlos, I'm going to say it's just a complete delight to hear you read tonight. Um, you know, just in my head, trying to do scanning on your poems, just looking at the mechanical devices that you use in your poems. What I picked up on real quick was your use of alliteration and assonance. But what I love about your poetry is that it's not contrived. You'll put an S, you'll do a series of S words that begin with S, but then you'll put an S at the end of the word where you can act so you stay within that kind of lyric and that rhythm and it's not contrived. And and it just helps you helps the listener paint that picture without having to pause. And it's just been it's clever, it's beautiful, and it's a jerk I like to hear. <laughs> Well, I, all I can say is, would you, would you like to repeat that in, in a New York Times Sunday? But it's a great, I, you know, uh, this is serious. Uh, mostly, when what you've been writing for 30 or 40 years, you don't pay really close attention to that. You're just, you're on another wave, but other people do. And I'm glad to hear that this kind of helps you when you're listening to my poetry, and not just the words, but things are going on. Because I never f consider myself musical in my poetry. Oh, oh, oh. oh what do you usually call it? Tin ear. <laughs> I have a tin ear. Anyway, that's great. OK. A anybody uh, have a question? Uh, uh, I'll sign on it. It's great. Anybody want to ask another question? How long have you been writing? Four. S depends on who you ask. Uh, at, at least. Uh, I think I say 60 years. I, I like to think I started writing when I was in the fifth grade in 1945. It wasn't much that I was writing then, but I was writing. And poetry, 40, 50 years, I guess. I'm trying to learn how to write, you know. You know, doctors practice medicine, I practice poetry. Oh, good, a question, another question. Uh, is that an answer? Yes. You are so observant with the details. You 
take note of the time, or does it just come back to you at the time you're writing? No, uh, any smart, intelligent writer would take notes. I just, <laughs> like I said, sometimes in my in my notebook I will write down something, but it may be the weather and not what I saw. But I have that kind of incredible ego that says, it's all there, I'm absorbing it. Whenever I want it, I can get it out. Uh, maybe not. You know, you like to think you can. <laughs> But I did have the experience that the other day where I go walking, I uh, came down from where I walk and there was a young lady spread eagle with her arms around a tree and then sort of a, some kind of incredible embrace. And I went, hmm, what that's all about. So I, I kind of made a little note in my notebook besides something about I saw the, the latest birds to arrive. And then I was talking to a neighbor and she said, you know, Carlos, I got something you might be interested in writing about. So I was just coming down from my walk to the and here's this young lady spreading eagle by the street. And I said to myself, that's something Carlos would write about. <laughs> so I said to her, I said, Greta, I did. I put it in my notebook. So uh, I forgot what the question was. But uh, I don't, you know, a really good writer, and I'll bet you any writer in this room does it, keeps careful notes. My, and besides, half the time I open up my notebook, I can't read what the hell it was I wrote. I'm serious. So I try to do that. Uh, and sometimes, it, you know, sometimes I do take kind of notes up here. But if it's something that really strikes me, then I will. For example, the other night, I had a dream. <laughs> How's it start, huh? Um, <laughs> I was walking down a straight road. Maybe some of you will write a poem about this. And I saw this silvery creature. You know, I'd been hit by a car. It looked like it might be an ermine or, you know, who knows what. When I got up, it was a big bullfrog, squashed. <laughs> I've, I've got a note on that somewhere. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, I guess the real answer is whatever works for you. But I don't. I'm not a careful writer, and that does not mean that I don't admire and uh, encourage careful writing, because you should be careful writers. And it's a very important thing, and just to sort of, oh, that's easy, that's poem. You know, it's more important than that. It's important to take notes. It works for you. Well, as my former mother-in-law used to say, even the blind pig gets an acorn every once in a while. <laughs> So, this is my latest acorn. Does anybody else have a question? Yes. Oh, Lex, how are you? I want you to read one more poem. Okay. Which one? I don't care. You don't care. Okay. Hang on. Since this is a request, I have the largesse to read any damn kind of poem I want. So it might be it might be a mess. Socks. In my cowboy boots, I wore an oddment of socks. She gave me hidden where different colors, sizes didn't matter. Old men, drunks, wore them dying like smoke from an ashtray. About all my aunt, the owner, collected of last month's rent, last month's unpaid rent. That and the feet's intimate apparel left by dead men in the Skid Row Hotel. Is that a poem? Wow. OK. Uh, Thank you. Thank you.